If you have your Bibles this morning, would you open to the first book, the book of Genesis, chapter 19? Genesis chapter 19. I didn't preach on this passage in a long, long time. In fact, I was thinking about that this week. How long has it really been since I preached on this passage? Of course, I began my ministry at least as far as being called to being a pastor in 1985. And so that is, uh, by my math, about 37 years ago. And uh, like many of you who are 40 and 50 and maybe older, you realize there has been a dramatic shift in our country on this particular issue that the Bible is going to give us insight into today. The title of this series of sermons that I'm doing is, is Yes, He Gets Us, Do We Get Him? Yes, He Gets Us, Do We Get Him? It's really not a question of whether he gets us. The question is, do we really get him? Can I ask you a series of questions this morning? Is there anybody that you've ever met more loving than God? You can answer that out loud. No. <clears throat> so there's not been anyone that you have met on the earth that is more loving than God. Then we would have to assume God is the most loving of anyone who has ever existed, that is, God is indeed, as the Bible says, love. And yet we find ourselves in a time where speaking truth is now seen as hate speech. Recently I read, and almost blushingly, when I read an article where Franklin Graham was accused of engaging in hate speech. Now, most of you who know Franklin Graham know that he is really nothing like his dad in the sense of there's really not a lot of fire or brimstone in anything that he says. And yet I think Franklin is guilty of one thing, which I want to be guilty of as well, and that is speaking the truth. But I want to do so in love. But I want you to know, especially those of you who are younger today, that there is an effort to condition you to things that are not biblical and to undermine the person of Christ himself. So I want to just ask you today, in light of the fact that he loves you more than anyone that you've ever met on the earth, do you love him more than anyone you have ever met on the earth? Now, wives, uh, that's a good thing if your husband loves Christ even more than he loves you. And that may not be great terminology. But you can understand that if he loves Christ supremely, that if the Bible says, Husbands, love yourselves as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, then you can understand that if he loves Christ supremely, you don't lose. He loves you. And so let me just tell you, young people, especially today, as you are being conditioned to accept things that in the past would have been shocking, I can tell you that when I was a boy growing up and these issues were first beginning to really be surfaced and spoken of in our culture, that my parents were very shocked, were shocked at the very notion of these things uh, being accepted by more and more people. You go into shops today and... And they have taken the beautiful symbol of God, which is uh, what uh, relates to the time of the flood. You remember the rainbow? What a beautiful symbol that is. And yet, even in my own eyes, I began to kind of despise looking at it because I know exactly what it stands for today. If you're a Sunday school teacher today and you teach about the rainbow, you have to be sure that you're explaining to your young people exactly what the rainbow means. It is not a symbol of deviant, aberrational, and in-your-face behavior that is an abomination to God, homosexuality. Amen. It is not that. But it has been co-opted smartly, I think, by people to use as a symbol of something that it was never intended to stand for. So this morning, I'm going to engage in hate speech. Now, I want you to know that I don't believe it is hate speech. I believe to speak truthfully. And I, young people, I want you to listen to me today because I'm telling you right now, you're going to stand before God. 
And you're going to give an account for the very fact that you didn't love him enough to stand up for him. Let that fall where it falls. Jesus said, do you love me more than these? I'm telling you this morning that if you love him supremely, you're in a terrible place today because the world is going to hell in a handbasket. It has redefined everything and it believes that God is not God anymore. And I must tell you today that I didn't get into ministry to be a part of a world that is anti-God and anti-Christ and to simply go with the flow. I'm willing to stand for God. Are you? Yes. That's right. I'm looking at you. Because we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today if we had. Now, I want you to know, I have friends who are living this lifestyle. And we've all sinned. But when we, when we begin to say that these things are combat, compatible with Christianity, let me ask you this. Is adultery compatible with Christianity? No. Is idolatry compatible with Christianity? No. Is homosexuality compatible with Christianity? No. Now, is that the, the talk of a preacher? No. That's scripture. So look at Genesis chapter 19 this morning. I thought because of my friends were. God said, did you love me more? Or did you love your friends more? And truthfully, that's not even right. Because if you love your friends, what do you want? You want to see them go to heaven, don't you? Don't you want to see them have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Listen, relationships with Christ are not on our terms. They're on His terms. You say, what's a rub? That's how much I love him and how much I fall short and how much I fail, but I love him. And I'm willing to stand wherever he tells me to. I can't go to youth town, which I'm going to in a few days. I can't do a revival. I can't preach here on Sunday mornings and ignore parts of the Bible, can I? Chapter 19, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was standing in the gate of Sodom. This is, is the nephew of Abraham. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And he said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Now this is eastern hospitality. You have dirty feet that need to be washed. It's a way of demonstrating a very kind and gracious way of dealing with your neighbor. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So here we have these messengers. We're going to assume they're angels, of course. And uh, here they are and Lot, and Lot has said, I'm going to put you up in my place. Perhaps Lot knows, I think Lot knows, the condition of the city that he lives in. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people 
to the last man surrounding the house, and they called a lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have sex with them. Now, some of you have a translation that says, no, that does not mean good afternoon, good morning, how are you doing? That is an intimate word of expression here that is the word for sexual relations. Now, I'm going to get the New Testament here in just a moment in chapter 1 of the book of Romans. But let me ask you this question. Are you for everything God's for? Do you love everything God loves? Are you against everything that God is against? And do you, dare you, hate those things which God hates? Now, I didn't say anybody. I didn't say we hate people. But do we hate sin as God hates sin? Would you like to ask me what I think about this? It doesn't matter. How about that? It absolutely doesn't matter what I think about this. What matters is, is what God thinks about it. Now, I hope what I think aligns with God, and I'm confident it does, but that's what really matters is how does God view this? And I'm going to tell you in a few moments why God views it the way God views it, because this generation is asking this question over and again. Can't you just let people live and let people alone and let people just do whatever they want to do? I can. I can. I do all the time. Don't I? Out in my little corner in McNary County, I don't do anything. I don't bother anybody. You know, I don't, I don't run around aggravating people. Absolutely. But the question is not about me. The question is about God, is it not? All right, but before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, and the people of the last man surround the house, and they called a lot. This is verse 5. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have sexual relations with them. So first of all, you don't need to think that this is new. This has been around a long time, right? So... It's not something that just showed up last evening so that preachers could be preaching about it. It's not some Disney fabricated. It's not something that corporate America created. It is something that has been a long time, but corporate America, Disney, all these other places, our companies are really a big problem today because they take all the dollars that we give them, and we give them a lot of them, dollars, I do too, and they use these dollars to promote values that are anti-Christ, and that they are after the church today, and they're doing a pretty doggone good job with what they're doing today. So anyway, sexual relations with them. And Lot went out to meet the men at the entrance. He shut the door after them, and he said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. So wickedness and wickedness, even though Lot is Eastern and even though Lot feels responsibility for protecting these men, we just have all kinds of wickedness going on here. <clears throat> but they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. And so this story continues on and on and on and you get the gist of what has been what is being said here. Whereas the angels are now going to rescue Lot and their intention is, is to rescue Lot and all of his family. But they essentially are unable to do that and so they rescue Lot and they rescue his wife and they rescue his two daughters. But we are told in verse 26 that in verse 26, Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. She had difficulty, obviously, leaving the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah behind. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah are not clear exactly where they were, but they, most scholars think that they're probably on the eastern side of the Jordan and in, in, the, in the country of what is now Jordan. Now, what, what, is, what are we to make of this? Well, let me tell you what we're to make of this. Look at verse 23. 
The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, uh, biblical scholars have looked at this a number of different ways, and some have said, well, this was a volcanic eruption, or this was something else. Well, either way, the Bible says this was something God did in order to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, whose sin was the sin of homosexuality. Now, uh, some years ago, there was a series entitled The Bible. Some of you remember that, right? And uh, it was, I really wanted to see, well, what are they going to do with this, right? Because you, you just know, you just know there, there is not going to be very many people other than preachers tell you the truth on this. Is that right? Is that right? That's right, isn't it? There's not, guys like me, you know, there's not going to be many of us uh, that are going to, going to tell you the truth on this. So, so therefore, you're just not going to hear the truth about this anymore. It's just going to be a, uh, well, it's a lifestyle, or, well, I was born this way, or, or you know, uh, boys and girls can be in the same bathroom. What's the big deal? Nobody knows what their gender is anymore. It's non-binary, and just all these kinds of things going on in our culture that uh, just has come unhinged, as you know, and none of us have any idea what's coming next, but we know it's not going to be good, right? So having said that, uh, when we when look at this passage of Scripture, uh, when we think about how they did we dealt with it in this Bible series, it is essentially that what they were guilty of was being inhospitable to strangers. That's the way they dealt with it. They just weren't being nice to the messengers or the angels that came in. Well, that's not what the Bible says. So the series on the Bible got the Bible wrong, didn't it? Now, there were some things about that series that were really good. I didn't see all of it. I saw some of it. Some of it was really good. But you couldn't ask them to be an honest broker on this issue because you can't do that. You can't do that. How many of you know that if I had a really large presence on social media, that they would be destroying me right now? How many of you know that they would even put my address of where I live? They would even put my family's names. That's the culture we're living in today. I got to stand for God. And so do you. It's appointed once for a man to die and after this is judgment. I know if you're in your 90s, you've got to be shocked where, where we are today. In my 60s, I am. I know you got to be, man. I know you got to be. You got to be shocked. But we're here. And so the sin of inhospitality might be in treat indeed a sin, but that's not what's the sin here. The sin is send them out so that we might have sexual relations with them. And they had become so wicked that these angels, these men of God, did not scare them at all. Afraid of God. They're afraid of God. When a nation loses its fear of God, it is destined for the trash heaps of history. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When I was a kid, the fear of Mama was the beginning of wisdom. She's gone to be with the Lord, but I'm still afraid of her. That was the beginning with the fear of God is the beginning. Let, who do you, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm just trying to say to you, who do you fear the most? Do you, do you fear what a student will say more than God? Do you fear what your spouse will say more than God? Do you fear what a church member will say more than God? Do you fear that what Disney will say more than God? Well, who do you fear more than God? Now, I get it. We're under grace. I get it. I know all that. But that doesn't change 
the equation that I will have to stand before him someday. Now, would you go to the book of Romans because uh, for, for the three people that will listen to this outside of you, uh, they, they'll always say something like, well, that's the Old Testament. You know, that's the Old Testament. So we, yeah, I don't know. We do away with that. We just do away with that. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's a, that dude's angry. That's a mad God. We want to get over here to Jesus. Right? He gets us. He gets us. I knew a man. And he went around doing good things. And he told people lots of nice things. But people didn't get him. But he gets us. That's Jesus. So, let's go to Romans chapter 1, right? Romans chapter 1. Now let's ask the question, does God have anything to say? Before I get there, I want to quote a couple of verses. Is Sodom and Gomorrah historical places? They sure are. Because Jesus said, truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Now here he's talking about what his disciples had gone and they didn't receive them. And then just one more chapter later it records, but I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So Jesus referred to these places, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom. Chapter 1 of the book of Romans. Verse 24. Now, here you're going to see exactly what we're up against. Exactly what we're up against. Verse 24. Now, I'm going to give you some illustrations of this in a moment. Uh, but there's a word in here. It's called reprobate. Therefore, God gave them up and their lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Hear that? For a lie. Well, what's the lie? Well, the lie is that I can be homosexual and be a Christian. That's the lie. What does it mean? It means that somebody who is engaging in homosexual behavior needs to repent of that and trust in Christ and let Christ take away that temptation from them. It may not come immediately, but over time it will come. That's grace. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to the dishonoring of bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever and amen. Well, what's being said there? They just decided that they worship themselves more than they do God. What is that called? Idolatry. See, this, this age is not that unusual. It's just an idolatrous age where we worship ourselves more than we do God. I'm going to get more to that in a moment. For this reason... God gave them up to dishonorable pleasure, or passions, pleasures, you could say. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise, likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their, for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind what ought not to be done. Now, did you notice that God gave them up, verse 24? Did you notice that God gave them up, verse 26? Did you notice that God gave them up, verse 28? In other words, now the argument is no longer a biblical argument. It is we just do whatever seems right to us. Whatever we decide. Whatever we, whatever we want to do. Now, 
what, is, what has happened? How in the world did we get to this? We know the Supreme Court had something to do with it, but how in the world did we get to the position that we're in where it's no longer even debated in our society whether it's right or wrong? It's frankly, if you disagree with us, we will marginalize you, we will destroy you, and we will shut you up. How many of you think that the things I've said today I can deliver on college campuses in America? Some, maybe, but not many, right? Not many. It kind of reminds me of some years ago that there was a revival and uh, the preacher announced what he was going to preach on in the morning before the evening and he was going to do the rich young ruler, Elvis. That afternoon, he got so many phone calls threatening him for even considering Elvis to, to be the rich young ruler that he had to withdraw his sermon. Now, that's kind of funny in a way and sad in another way. That may be what I do one of my sermons on. In all seriousness, though, you know, our universities were founded by men of God. Almost 100%. Especially the old Ivy League schools, they were like Harvard, Yale. These, these were schools, what were they founded for? The equipping and training of ministers of the gospel and missionaries. And yet today, if you announce that your certain speakers announce they're coming to a university, they'll, oh no. And if they do a subject like this, oh no. Why? Because children, young people say, we don't feel safe. We feel like you're creating a dangerous environment, and therefore we cannot have that. All the time, Satan is as funeral after funeral comes, and they say we don't want the gospel preached anymore. Funerals today, we don't want to. No, no, no. I can't tell you how many people today tell me, Brother Standish, do something real short there. Do something real short. We don't, we don't want the gospel preached. We don't want that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And let, let me just say to you, I'm not going to put up with that. Because I believe in this time that we live in, it's important for men of God, women of God, for all of us who love God to take a stand, no matter what the consequences and the cost might be. We have to be willing to take a stand. Now, why is this, we, we've talked a little bit about why, why is this happening, what is this uh, shift that we've had in our culture. Can I ask you a question? Do you think God has changed? You think God in heaven has gone, you know what? I was right then, but I, I understand now that I was a little bit wrong. And so, uh, you know, we're going to have to change all that. Why, why is this a, considered to be an abomination and so offensive to God? Well, because He created us. He loves us. And you and I will never know how much God loves us. Because He can look at us and say, this is not good for you because I created you. I know everything about you. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And I understand everything that there is about you emotionally, psychologically, physically. I understand everything about you spiritually. And I realize this is not the best for you. And you're settling for something that is counterfeit to what I have for you. You see? You see? How many of you have raised children and looked up one day and they had a boy or a girl, depending on what gender they were, and they had a person sitting in your living room and you looked them over and went, mm-hmm. Oh, really? 
You mean all? <laughs> Some of you, it's coming, right? Oh, and all the sacrifice that you did and all of the times you took them to school and all the times you agonized over them and all the times you prayed for them and you look up and up, oh, whoa. Yeah. And that's God. And God has not changed. The Bible says God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And it's been said, and I'll repeat it again, if God ignores America and the condition of America, he then must apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that not right? Of course that's right. He must apologize. God created us. He has a purpose for us. Today is the seventh anniversary of me flipping my tractor over. Now, that may not mean a thing to you. It would have, though, if seven years ago you had attended my funeral. But just briefly, I was just on my tractor having a really fine time going through the weeds, not realizing the weeds belied the fact that just ahead was a hole that was about this deep, that when I ran my left front wheel off into it, the right rear wheel of my tractor came up, and about two or three seconds later, I found myself underneath my tractor with it still running. And there was a tiny little tree, and I'm telling you, it was no bigger than this, that my tractor had rested against while I was laying on the ground looking up. And if you want to see the picture, it's not of me looking up because it's not a staged event. But if you want to see a picture of me standing next to my tractor, I have them on my cell phone. But there was a tiny little tree that stopped the final roll of the tractor as I was laying underneath it before it would come to rest on top of me. Why did I tell that? Well, because I do like the fact that you can put that stuff in the cloud and it just shows up out of nowhere. I had no idea the day was seventh day until I was on my way to church and there it was. I tell you for this reason. Because I think God had a purpose in my life and I think if he hadn't beyond the moment, that would have been it. Because don't you know people die all the time? And he had me right in the crosshairs, it would have been easy. But I tell you, I believe just as Scripture says that I was saved for such a time as this, and I believe you were too. And I believe we're to be loving, and I believe we're to be kind, but I believe we are, as I hammered my fist to this pulpit earlier, not out of frustration and not out of anger, but I hammered my fist to this pulpit as a way of saying I drive a tent peg into this and say, this is where I stand. People like to say they want to be on the right side of history. And there have been theologians and others who were dubious in their Christian commitment who have written articles saying that the church is on the wrong side of history on this. Let me tell you this. The only history we care about is God. And I'm willing to stand with Him if He will let me. Because I believe at the end of this matter... God will be the final judge, and he already has been. And he says this, There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Now, lest you get confused, if I had a, a granddaughter or a grandson that was living a homosexual lifestyle, I would love them just like I love all of my family. I would. They'd be welcome at my table anytime. I would never treat them unlovingly. But on the other hand, I would never compromise on the scripture. And my hope would be that prayerfully and lovingly and charitably, they would come to know Jesus Christ. 
as their personal savior. Do you understand where I'm coming from today? There is not a mean bone in my body. I'm not angry with anyone. But I love God enough to take a stand. About 30 years ago, as I recall, and don't hold me to it, right? Because sometimes I can't remember what happened yesterday. But about 30 years ago, I was at a, a service. I was in Kansas. And I was in a service. And it was a service of uh, young men in particular giving their testimony about Jesus. And what he'd done in their lives. And in particular, one young man stood up and he said, I just want to tell you what I've been struggling with. It took a lot of courage. He told us. And it was what you think it was. And he knew there were a lot of preachers in this group. In fact, most of the men there were preachers. And he said, I want to ask you to do something for me. And it's not just for me, but it's for God. But I want to ask you to do something for me. And of course, we were all eager to, right? Yes, yes, we'll do anything for you, right? With the mood, the, the tone, the, the, the meeting, it just lent itself to doing whatever we could for this young man, right? Because he was young in the faith, and we thought we got to do something. And he said, here's what I want you to do for me. And I can't remember exactly how he said it, but I can give you the gist of it. He said, preachers, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you to compromise in the days ahead. He said, but don't do it. He said, don't you ever do it. He said, because I was a young man who was trapped in homosexuality. He said, I was trapped. He said, I had, he had, I had deceived myself into believing that I could be both a Christian and live a sinful lifestyle. And I was tolerating my life as it was, but there were times when I was suicidal and I didn't think I could get through another day. But he said, I heard the gospel. And I heard how a man can be saved. I heard how a man can have a new life. And he said, I began a journey that I had been on for, and I don't remember how many years, with Jesus Christ. And he said, preachers, if you compromise, nobody will ever hear the truth, and nobody will begin that journey, and nobody will come out of darkness into light, and nobody will come out of death into life. And please, whatever you do, don't compromise the truth. And I agree with that. And so we lovingly, kindly, graciously say, I've had people say to me, well, Brother Stan, would you allow homosexuals to come to your church? Absolutely. They've been here lots of times and you didn't know it. Might be here today. Absolutely. Would you hug them? Yeah, I'll hug them. Would you go eat with them? Yeah, I'll go eat with them. Will you mow their yard? Yeah. Will you give them money? Yeah. Will you let them spend the night at your house? I might. Do you understand where I'm coming from? There go I, if not for the grace of God, in any number of sins. But what I will not do is look at someone and say, you can go your own way.
I'm not Fleetwood Mac. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus. And someday I'll stand before him and look at him, and he will know all mysteries he already does. And what'd you do with my gospel? What'd you do when America went apostate? What'd you do when America turned its back on me? What'd you do when the church emptied out? stand together. Father, we know it takes courage to lovingly, kindly, graciously, obediently, humbly stand for truth. Let us be the church that does, not out of meanness or unkindness or apathy, but that we do so because you've called us to this. And it is you who we love. If it was not for your grace, we would all be burned up in Sodom and Gomorrah. It is your kindness and your goodness that saves us. And your cross that cleanses us. In Jesus' name.